My name is Mike Stewart. I'm with the International Plant Nutrition Institute, IPNI. And uh, many of you may remember uh, uh, Potash and Phosphate Institute, PPI, from many years ago. Uh, IPNI grew out of PPI. PPI no longer exists. And I started my uh, career with the Institute with PPI uh, for approximately 18 years ago. So I've been with the Institute some time. And for those who may not know, we're an industry supported organization. We're supported now as IPNI by manufacturers of fertilizer, nitrogen, phosphorus, potash, and other fertilizer materials from all over the world. So we're truly now an international organization. Uh, we have international staff and we all to some degree work internationally as well. And we are, uh, you may uh, think of us as something like an association that would be as close as I could come to describing this. And we handle a lot of the science issues or we try to address a lot of the science issues for the industry. And actually, uh, my direct supervisor, Dr. Paul Fixon, was supposed to be here to give this talk today, but he had to be in the Philippines and so he can make it. So I'll try to cover this topic of global supply of phosphorus in, in his place. And really, this probably should more accurately be titled Global Supply of Phosphate Rock. And uh, I feel, in a way, I feel like a fish out of water at this meeting, talking about commercial fertilizer phosphorus in a meeting of manure. But this is, this is nevertheless a very important topic and one that's been in the news a lot especially over the last eight or ten years. And uh, let me just start by saying that what I think probably most of us know is phosphate rock is an ore, kind of a loose term applied to an ore material from which all, practically all, modern commercial phosphorus fertilizer is made. And what I want to do is, uh, is start just with a little verbal uh, outline of, of what I'd like to do. Uh, with a little bit about the history of the phosphorus fertilizer industry and then move from there and talk a little about, a little about phosphate rock deposits, how they occur and where they occur and how they're mined and things like that. And then uh, move into some definitions. We'll define two key words, reserves and resources. Uh, and then look at a little bit about the history of determination of reserves and resources very briefly. That's very relevant to this discussion of global, current global supplies of phosphate rock. And then, then take a look at just where we are in these estimates now and look at uh, some longevity projections in, in terms of how much phosphate rock do we have left. So with that, let me start with a little brief history of the uh, phosphate fertilizer industry. Many of you probably already know this, but as you could imagine, early phosphorus fertilizers were animal based. They were manure, guano was a big one, and bones. And bones are comprised primarily of calcium phosphate. And calcium phosphate, as most of us know, is in, in and of itself somewhat, uh, uh, well, let's just say sparingly soluble. And it was discovered in the mid-1800s that you could treat bones with acid and, and it would produce phosphoric acid and it greatly enhanced the fertilizer value of, of bones, of the phosphorus in bone. Shortly after that, the first patent was issued for the treatment of both bones and apatite, which is the calcium phosphate mineral in phosphate rock. Uh, the first uh, uh, patent was issued in the mid-1800s for the treatment of these materials with acid, and that was the birth of the modern phos phosphorus fertilizer industry. And so today, the vast majority of all modern commercial phosphorus <coughs> fertilizer is produced from this process of treating phosphate rock with acid, either sulfuric or in some cases nitric, to produce phosphoric acid. And from that, all these different uh, phosphorus fertilizers, MAP, DAP, triple superphosphate, ordinary superphosphate, the polyphosphates, all these are produced. Now, uh, <clears throat> what about these deposits? What about phosphate rock itself? Most deposits are sedimentary in origin. Most deposits that are exploited are mined. The uh, term exploitation carries with it some negative implications, but it, I mean it not negatively, but most 
Most phosphate rock that's exploited or mined by the industry is sedimentary in origin. And these sedimentary deposits were laid down in ancient continental shelf environments. They occur all through uh, geologic history. And um, they were the result, it's interesting the way these were laid down, they were the, the result of uh, direct precipitation of calcium phosphate in waters that became supersaturated with phosphate. Uh, and most of these deposits are mined by conventional open pit mining techniques. There is some shaft mining of phosphorus, uh, phosphate rock, but most of it is open pit mining. And there are igneous deposits as well uh, that are uh, mined or exploited for phosphorus fertilizer production, but the vast majority are sedimentary deposits. And this is a map of where the resources the known resources of phosphorus, uh, phosphate rock occur throughout the world. And you see a mix of them. the blue dots, if you can make those out, are igneous and the green are sedimentary. And you see a mix of igneous and sedimentary. And let me emphasize that these are resources. These are not necessarily all deposits that are economical to uh, produce. This is just where we know there's phosphate rock. And uh, a couple of Things I'll point out, for example, in the U.S., most of the phosphate rock is mined in Florida. Uh, in, the, in, in the U.S., all the deposits are sedimentary, and the biggest deposits known in the world are here in North Africa, and they're all sedimentary. So the most important deposits, without question, are sedimentary. Another thing I'll, you'll notice in this map is that there are some countries that don't have phosphate rock resources, and we're going to touch on that again in a minute. Some people are somewhat concerned about that, but we'll get to that in a minute. So what are reserves and what are resources? Reserves can be find, defined very simply as uh, that rock or phosphate rock that can be economically produced at the time of determination using existing technology. And there are two key words in that definition, uh, economics and technology. Economics and technology are dynamic, they change. Uh, and so with changes in economics and technology, how we define reserves change. And a good example of that is uh, if we look at another industry, look at the natural gas situation in the U.S. Uh, in 10 years, we've gone, we've made a 180 degree turn in, 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 that, uh, uh, in, in, in that picture, uh, in our situation with natural gas because of the, the application of newer technologies to, uh, to the exploitation of, of that natural resource. Uh, resources, on the, other word, uh, on the other hand, are, uh, uh, um, are phosphate rock of any grade, inclu including reserves that may be produced at some time in the future. So resources are, uh, the uh, resource is much more vague and broad, but it has its purpose, and, and we'll talk a little bit about resources as we go through this more. So this system appears straightforward at first, but it's really uh, uh, plagued with a fair amount of uncertainty. And I think it's instructive just to look at the source of some of the uncertainty in uh, phosphate rock reserve and resource estimation. One is simply that some parts of the world are just incompletely explored, haven't been explored yet. A good example of that is Iraq. In 2011, Iraq had never had any reserves listed. And then in 2011, the Iraqi government and the USGS, United States Geological Survey, and I'll talk more about the USGS, but they uh, uh, discovered reserves in Iraq, and all of a sudden they had tremendous re reserves, several times more than the United States just in one year. And that's been revised downward somewhat now, but that's a good example of, of an area that ha had not been... Uh, adequately explored. So that's one source of, uh, of, uh, of uncertainty in this, uh, in this process of making these estimates. Another is that some co uh, companies and some countries for that matter may consider information on reserves confidential for strategic purposes. We'll see an example of that in a graph I'll show you later of a, of a major, of, uh, major reserve holder in the world. Uh, this uh, system of uh, estimating reserves and resources requires massive data input and maintenance. And we'll go through this in a minute, but uh, there, at least for the last 10 or 20 years, there's really been insufficient data present in the, uh, 
traditional literature to make as good a estimates as we could and should be making. Uh, and there's uh, another item that adds to the complication here is there's inconsistency worldwide in the terms and definitions. In other words, some countries may define reserves differently than other countries or uh, bodies or, 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 or entities. Uh, and again, these uh, estimates can change with fluctuations in technology and economics. So these estimates are dynamic and definitely should be viewed as approximations and are subject to pretty dramatic changes in a short period of time, as we'll see in a minute. Now, I want to go through very briefly some history in, uh, in this process of uh, or in, in estimation of reserve and resource estimates. And I think this is relevant because it, 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 I'm going to bring us up to, to, to present here in a minute. But, uh, and by the way, let me mention as I go through this and everything on the screen, I took out of a publication by IFPC, International Fertilizer Development Center. And I'll talk more about IFPC in a minute. But in the early 1970s, there was a conference in Chicago. It was the Institute of Ecology uh, Conference. And from that conference came publications and proceedings and things like that. And in that conference, they, in, in those publications, they uh, drew attention to PR reserves, phosphate rock reserves, and they estimated that the world would be out of phosphate rock within about 90 to 130 years. And so this uh, generated a lot of interest in phosphate rock. So all through the 70s and 80s, there's a lot of information on, on phosphate rock reserves, estimates, and exploration, uh, a lot of geological information. And I, I know that from, a, a co-authored a chapter in the ASA phosphorus monograph some years ago. And, and indeed, there is a lot of information through the 70s and 80s on phosphate rock. And the USGS and US Bureau of Mines were very involved in that at that time. Well, in the mid-90s, Congress closed the Bureau of Mines. And so by 96, they had laid off uh, about 1,000 people somewhere in that neighborhood. And so with those layoffs went a lot of experience and uh, institutional memory and a lot of resources that had previously been brought to bear in these types of investigations. And so consequently since the early to mid 90s there's been uh, uh, somewhat uh, limited uh, uh, detailed traditional public literature on uh, reserves and resources and phosphate, it just brought to bear on phosphate rock. Now, I'm going to fast forward up to the mid to late 2000s, and I want to look at, uh, uh, at uh, or point out that in, starting in about the mid 2000s to in going through the late 2000s, there were a number of publications and postings and articles uh, drawing attention to uh, a looming phosphate rock crisis. There were those who were saying we were going to peak at phosphate rock production by 2030 or 2035, and then more or less the wheels were going to come off after that. And some of these headlines were pretty uh, alarmist in nature. And, uh, these were all, and it's very important to point out here, that these were all based on uh, the USGS, United States Geological Survey, uh, numbers and uh, uh, for estimates and uh, our, our estimates, excuse me, for reserves and resources. And uh, <clears throat> As I pointed out, since the mid-90s, there's been limited resources uh, available to, to make these estimates. So in response to all these headlines that were coming out uh, 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 for a, uh, pointing out to, toward a potential crisis with phosphate rock, in response to this, IFDC, IFDC, International Fertilizer Development Center, which is a remnant of the old TVA, they're located in Muscle Shoals, Alabama. Um, launched an effort to uh, review both uh, past and present literature on phosphate rock uh, reserves and to try and make uh, updated uh, estimates for phosphate rock reserves and resources. And this uh, was done by a, a guy or led by a guy named Steve Van Kallenberg. And Steve is a, a geologist uh, that's been in the business a long, long time. I co-authored the book chapter I mentioned a minute ago with him. 
And Steve, if he's not the world's authority on phosphate rock, he's at least among the world's authority on phosphate rock. And this uh, publication that they came out with, it was published in 2010, is available online at their, at their uh, website. But um, it's got a very nice liter literature review, and, and, and then also he, um, they took information uh, from, uh, published from governments, from uh, companies, um, proceedings papers and presentations, anything they could bring to bear, they brought to bear to update these estimates. And so let's take a look very briefly at what they found. And the way I've laid this out is the uh, blue is USGS and the orange is IFDC. This is in billions of tons of reserves worldwide. And in 2010, USGS had estimate, estimated that there were 16 billion tons worldwide of phosphate rock. Uh, uh, and that same year, IFDC, 2010, came out with their estimate, and they estimated significantly higher than that at 60 billion metric tons. And so the next year, USGS, the Mineral, mineral Commodity Summary, their estimates were revised upward to 65 billion metric tons. So in one year, the USGS numbers went went up by fourfold. So if you're doing projections of longevity, uh, just simple projections of longevity, uh, that your projections would go up fourfold just from that, that change in reserves. Now, what about resources? The US, uh, excuse me, IFDC uh, estimated that the world has about 290 billion tons of uh, phosphate rock resources. In the USGS, I've just looked at their mineral commodity summaries for the last few years, last five or six years, and they had no numbers published for uh, resources until 2012 where they uh, began to say that we have over 300 billion tons of resources. So this <clears throat> IFDC effort had a, had a uh, pretty big impact on, on uh, the formal uh, numbers used for projection of longevity, uh, those would be the USGS numbers. Now, let's look at, and you may ask, a, a very obvious question is, where did all these resources, all these, excuse me, reserves, where did all these additional reserves come from? And really, the answer to that is in one country, and that's Morocco. Uh, Morocco has a tremendous amount of phosphate rock. And if you look at the, uh, this, figure shows uh, phosphate rock reserves over time from the late 80s up through 2011, and Morocco is the green line here. And they uh, were at right about 6 billion tons of reserves for a very long time. And uh, after the IFDC report, they shoot up here to 50 billion tons, so a tremendous increase in reserves in Morocco. And this IFDC report, uh, he states that they may very well have a whole lot more than that, that that we're not aware of because the country hasn't been completely explored for it. Uh, notice here, uh, just kind of an unusual thing, China's this brownish colored line here. And prior to 2003, they were a very minor player in reserves, but all of a sudden they go up to number one for several years and then go, go back down. Well, that was the first year the Chinese government re released <coughs> statistics on phosphate rock. So you can see how uh, political things can influence these numbers as well and how dramatically uh, they can change. Now, if we're going to look at, and I'm going to wrap this up pretty quick, I think I'm about out of time. If we're going to look at projections and how much do we ha address the question of how much do we have left, we have to look at production. What is phosphate rock production? And that's what we look at in this slide. This is in millions of tons this time, instead of billions, everything before the reserves and resources were billions. Millions of tons, uh, metric tons, it should be metric tons, of, uh, of uh, phosphate rock production. If you look at the world, there was a peak here uh, in the late 80s, and then it tapered off uh, significantly uh, in the early 90s. That was because of the collapse of the former Soviet Union. And then it's crept back up, and we're back we're well beyond those late 80 numbers now, and we're on a pretty steep incline uh, in, in growth in phosphate rock production. We're currently at a 210 
million metric tons. And USGS in their latest mineral commodity summary says that by in 2013 they estimate we'll go to 250 million metric tons. I think that's pretty, that may be a pretty ambitious uh, estimate, but, but we'll see. Notice that China's really here, that's a green line, they've really ramped up production. And I would say Morocco, which is the yellow line, uh, there's an estimate that within the next seven or eight years they're going to double production and be somewhere up here. And so the phosphate rock production picture is changing significantly. But if we just take the latest numbers, and you can do this any way you want, but if we just take the latest numbers, which is a conventional way to do it, and we divide it out, reserves divided by production, with, with known reserves based on the latest numbers, the USGS numbers, we've got over 300 years of phosphate rock production left. And if we look at resources, which again is a little more iffy and vague, we've got well over a thousand years. So we're not facing uh, uh, a crisis in the foreseeable future. Uh, now, obviously and clearly, as we've seen going through this, phosphate rock is not evenly distributed globally. Uh, Morocco has, based on the latest numbers, 75% of the phosphate rock reserves. Uh, U.S. has 2%, China is 6%, and then there's a couple of countries with 3%, I think Tunisia and Algeria. Uh, and some see this as a problem uh, that one country could control so much rock. Some see it potentially as a problem. Others say no because of trade uh, balances and trade and that kind of thing. It's not going to be an issue. But just to mention it, that, that some, some, some see that as, that as a point of concern. Uh, now, PR is obviously a non-renewable resource and deserves our best stewardship efforts. Uh, no question about that. Uh, and the main thing I want to say is this, that this situation is dynamic and, and continually unfolding. So when we see headlines that are very alarmist uh, and predict a very uh, dire and severe uh, uh, situation looming in the near future, we need to be careful of that. We need to be careful of very hard and fast predictions because these things, these numbers can change significantly with technology, particularly with technology and economics. And with that, I'm done, Andrew. Sorry for going over. I'm sure we can, <clears throat> this is important, and uh, people don't mind eating into that break a little bit, but thanks for that cheerio note. Uh, mind <laughs>